Hello, this is Daphne, and I am reading the Cape Cod Times for Thursday, April the 25th. We begin with the weather. Today, chilly with plenty of sunshine, high of 47. Tonight, clear, low of 34. Friday, warmer with plenty of sunshine, high of 54, low of 38. Saturday, sunny to partly cloudy, high of 58, low of 42. Sunday, a shower in the area, mainly early, high of 57, low of 48. And Monday, times of clouds and sun, high of 62, low of 50. And the sun rose today at 5.46 a.m. and will set at 7 33, which gives us 13 hours and 47 minutes of daylight. On to the news. On the front page today, we have a photograph of eight people with a, a sling between them, and on that is a dolphin. And the caption reads, a dolphin is transported off the Wellfleet mudflats after stranding Tuesday. Rescuers responded to a mass dolphin stranding in Wellfleet Tuesday afternoon. Eleven Atlantic white-sided dolphins were found stranded on the outgoing tide. Eight were found in the Duck Creek area, and another three were stranded at the Gut, an area near the entrance to the Herring River. Ten of the dolphins were transported to Herring Cove Beach in Provincetown, where they were released. One dolphin died. And here's the article. Ten dolphins released off Provincetown Flats. Volunteers help animals stranded in Wellfleet, reported by Marilee Cassidy. Ten Atlantic white-sided dolphins were released off Provincetown Tuesday night after stranding on the mud flats in Wellfleet. A team from the International Fund for Animal Welfare Marine Mammal Rescue, volunteers, and AmeriCorps Cape Cod members, about 45 in all, responded after receiving a report of 11 dolphins stranded in Wellfleet Tuesday afternoon before the evening, the early evening low tide. Eight dolphins were found off Wellfleet Pier in Duck Creek. Three others were st stranded near the mouth of the Herring River. This area of the river, referred to as the Gut, is a frequent stranding location due to extreme tidal fluctuations and shallow slopes. One dolphin died on scene. Ras rescuers were met with harsh conditions at both locations with thick, muddy flats and pockets of water that they had to navigate as the tide continued to roll out. In Provincetown, rescuers added headlamps to their gear to help illuminate the way as they walked down to Herring Cove Beach, pushing the dolphin carts along the sandy path to where they would be released. After seven hours, over seven hours, the rescuers worked to get the dolphins off the flats and into transport vehicles. Six of the dolphins were transported in IFAW's Mobile Dol Dolphin Rescue Clinic, which allows veterinarians and other marine mammal technicians to stabilize the dolphins and perform health assessments before they are released back into deeper water. This rescue had many challenges due to the number of dolphins the difficult mud conditions, and having to deal with two simultaneous mass strandings, said Lauren Cooley, IFAW stranding biologist, in a press release. Quote, the team was able to overcome all of these challenges to give these dolphins their best chance at survival. End of quote. Columbia, students to scale down protests reported by John Bacon and Eduardo Cuevas for USA Today. Columbia University announced that students had agreed to scale down their encampment Wednesday as protesters across the nation pressed their demands for an end to the civilian casualties in Gaza that have tested the American public's historically ironclad support for Israel. Police in New York City made arrests for disorderly conduct after a street protest reached a standoff, days after hundreds of arrests were made at Columbia and New York University. Rallies and encampments have sprung up on campuses from 
California to Massachusetts this week, sometimes prompting police intervention. The protesters are calling for an end to U.S. military support for Israel and for eliminating Israeli investments. President Joe Biden signed a controversial aid package bill Wednesday that provides, among other things, $26 billion for Israel. Some of the money will provide desperately needed humanitarian aid for Palestinians in Gaza, but more than half will fund unconditional military aid for Israel, which has been a driving force for the university protests. In comments at the White House, Biden focused on the humanitarian aid and the threat Israel faces from Iran. Quote, my commitment to Israel is ironclad, he said, adding that more than $1 billion in aid is for Palestinians facing a humanitarian crisis because of, quote, the war Hamas started. California's Cal Poly Humboldt in Arcata, California, was closed Wednesday after pro-Palestinian protesters occupied a campus building. At the University of Minnesota campus in St. Paul, Minnesota, police cleared an encampment at the request of the school, which cited violations of university policy and trespassing law. And in Massachusetts, encampments have been erected at several multiple schools, including Tufts University, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Emerson College. The New York chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations, a Muslim civil rights organization, called on political leaders and university officials to stop endangering Jewish, Muslim, Palestinian, and other students who are conducting peaceful protests. Quote, students should not have to risk their reputation, livelihoods, or their safety to speak out against a genocide or their university's complicity in genocide. CAIR New York's executive director, Afas Nasher, said in a statement, Columbia students claim important victory. Columbia student protest organizers said Wednesday, the university has conceded to some demands, but that the school continues to put students at risk of attacks. Earlier, the school issued a statement saying protesters had agreed to remove a significant number of tents, allow only students to take part in the encampment, follow city fire safety rules, prohibit discriminatory or harassing language, and, quote, make the encampment welcome to all, close quote. Columbia Students for Justice in Palestine said administrators threatened to bring in police and the National Guard if protesters did not acquiesce to their demands. Quote, Columbia's reliance on the threat of state violence against peaceful protesters has created an unstable ground for the negotiations process, which will continue over the next 48 hours, the statement said, referring to a deadline the university has issued. However, Columbia's written commitment and concession not to call the NYPD or the National Guard signifies an important victory for students. Students at Brown University in Rhode Island established an encampment Wednesday with large signs announcing Gaza Solidarity Encampment and Brown Invests in the Palestinian Genocide prominently displayed. The encampment was set up hours after Provost Francis Doyle sent an email to all students warning that the encampments are a violation of university police and that participants could face disciplinary action, quote, up to and including separation from the university, close quote, the Brown Daily Herald reported. University spokesperson Brian Clark told the Herald that protest becomes unacceptable when it violates safety policies or interferes with, quote, regular operations of the university. We have been troubled by reports of violence, harassment, and intimidation at some encampments on other campuses, but we have not seen that kind of behavior at Brown, Clark said. Any such behavior would not be tolerated, close quote. In Brooklyn, police made scores of disorderly conduct arrests when a street protest Tuesday evening reached a standoff. The protesters had gathered in Grand Army Plaza and at the nearby home of Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, 
who has led the effort in Congress to provide funds for the Israeli military. The protesters, who conducted a Seder dinner outside the home, also were demanding a ceasefire in Gaza. Quote, we refuse to let our traditions be used to starve, displace, and massacre Palestinians, the Jewish Voice for Peace said in a post on social media platform X during the protest. The New York Police Department said officers arrested 208 demonstrators who blocked traffic at Grand Army Plaza. Biden's selection as commencement streak speaker at the May 19th graduate of Morehouse College in Atlanta is raising concerns among some Morehouse faculty members, according to NBC News. One Morehouse faculty member, who is not identified by NBC, told the television network that Morehouse administrators are concerned some faculty members will join students in protest during the graduation ceremony. Morehouse administrators agonized on online and agonized on an online meeting for Thursday to hear excuse me Morehouse administrators organized an online meeting for two, Thursday to hear feedback about the commencement selection process according to NBC Morehouse did not respond to requests from USA Today for comment State Moves Families from Shelter, reported by Zane Razak for the Cape Cod Times. Six migrant families staying at the Harbor Suite Hotels in South Yarmouth were moved to Kingston and Boston on Tuesday as a relocation, relocation process of 39 families staying at the hotel began, according to town administrator Robert Reitenauer. The remaining 35 families were to be transferred off Cape on both Wednesday and Thursday, said Reitenauer in an email to the Times. Transportation is provided by the state. As planned, all families will vacate Harborside Suites by Thursday afternoon, he said. A spokesman for the State Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities said the families will be transferred out of the Yarmouth Hotel Shelter site to existing off-cape emergency assistance shelter provider, provider agencies with 24-hour staffing, support services, and rehousing case management. The Yarmouth Hotel shelter site was staffed by the Massachusetts National Guard and did not have a contracted service provider. The moves are part of an ongoing effort to consolidate sheltering to reduce overhead costs and the number of sites, streamline resource allocation, and improve service delivery for shelter residents, said the spokesman. In December, about two dozen families were packed into a bus along with their belongings and transferred off Cape after staying at the Eastern Inn in Bourne for roughly three months. Families sheltered at the Eastern Inn were comprised of migrant families and long-term Massachusetts residents. That was the same mix of families currently being housed throughout the state, a spokesman for the state agency said at the time. In January, families sheltered at Joint Base Cape Cod were also moved, according to a state spokesman. In August, the base shelter was at capacity with 62 families. In, in August, the state had tapped 120 shelter units on Cape Cod to house migrants and displaced people as demand for the Massachusetts Emergency Assistance System grew. As of Wednesday, a number of traditional non-hotel emergency assistance family shelter units remained on Cape Cod, the state spokesman said. A majority of those existed prior to the expansion in the use of hotels for shelter, he said. There will no longer be any hotels on the Cape providing emergency assistance shelter once the transfers out of Yarmouth are complete by the end of April, the spokesman said. Families in the Yarmouth Hotel were informed of the move weeks in advance, and the hotel will no longer serve as an emergency assistance shelter. The state will work with affected school districts and families to make sure school-aged children continue their education. State officials said thousands of migrants in emergency assistance now have obtained their work authorizations and that hundreds have jobs throughout Massachusetts, while the Healy-Driscoll administration continues efforts to connect more with employers.
New U.S. rules crack down on airlines' hidden fees, reported by Kathleen Wong for USA Today. The Department of Transportation announced new rules on Wednesday to better protect airline passengers against costly surprise airline fees, the agency said. As part of the Biden-Harris administration's efforts to crack down on corporate ripoffs, two new air travel rules were finalized. The rules mandate that airlines pay full refunds in a timely and straightforward manner and ensure transparency regarding fees associated with air travel. The new regulations are expected to save consumers over half a billion dollars each year in hidden junk fees, the DOT said. Quote, passengers deserve to know up front what costs they are facing and should get their money back when an airline owes them without having to ask, Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg said in a statement. Today's air announcements will require airlines to both provide passengers better information about costs before ticket purchase and promptly provide cash refunds to passengers when they are owed, not only saving passengers time and money, but also preventing headaches, close quote. The first new regulation will simplify the process for airline passages to get what they're owed by requiring airlines to give automatic cash refunds. Passengers can get these refunds when their flights are, quote, canceled or significantly changed, their checked bags are significantly delayed, or the ancillary services like Wi-Fi that they purchased are not provided, the announcement said. The second will require our airlines and ticket agents to be upfront about any hidden fees, such as checking a bag or changing a flight, to help, quote, consumers avoid unneeded or unexpected changes that can quick, quickly increase and add significant cost to what may at first look like a cheap ticket, close quote. Airline fees, increasingly common for airlines to boost their profits, have grown confusing for passengers. Both rules will go into effect in about six months, or around the end of October, the agency said. Getting a refund from airlines is often a lengthy and often complicated process. Sometimes passengers end up getting a travel credit or voucher instead of an actual reimbursement or just a partial refund. Under the new regulation, refunds will be much more straightforward. Airlines must promptly provide automatic refunds without passengers explicitly requesting them, and the refunds must be issued in the original payment method used to make the purchase. Airlines will have seven business days to make full refunds for credit card purchases and 20 calendar days for other payment methods. It can be tricky to know exactly how much your final airline cost will how much your final airline ticket will cost due to hidden fees. What may look like a low price at first can quickly add up. Airlines will now have to disclose any baggage, change, and cancellation fees and policies before purchases are made, and it has to be clear and upfront, not hidden behind a hyperlink. Airlines will also need to be transparent about weight and dimension limitations. Third-party websites such as Expedia or Booking.com will also be required to display this information. These days, it's common for people to pay for seat selection, especially for the lowest price fares, but carriers will now need to inform consumers that seats are guaranteed and it's unnecessary to pay for one. The DOT is also banning airlines from using bait-and-switch tactics in which an airline advertises a discounted fare that doesn't include mandatory fees that drive the ticket price up. The new regulations are expected to save consumers over a half a billion dollars each year. Group sues over worker non-compete agreements, reported by Daniel Weissner from Reuters. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the country's biggest, largest business lobby, filed a lawsuit on Wednesday seeking to strike down a federal agency's near-total ban on employers requiring workers to sign agreements not to join rivals or launch competing businesses. The Chamber's lawsuit in, fed, 
in federal court in Tyler, Texas, alleges that the Federal Trade Commission lacks the power to adopt sweeping rules, such as the ban on so-called non-compete agreements released on Tuesday, which is set to take effect in August. The FTC is empowered by federal law to enforce existing antitrust laws passed by Congress, but not to enact rules determining what other type of conduct by businesses is anti-competitive, the chamber said in the lawsuit. Quote, companies will face substantial legal costs as they are forced to resort to other tools to attempt to protect their investments, the chamber said. And the economy as a whole will suffer as startups and small businesses are unable to provide dominant to prevent dominant firms from hiring their best employees and gaining access to their confidential information. Close quote. The lawsuit comes after tax service firm Ryan LLC on Tuesday filed the first legal challenge to the FDC rule in a different federal court in Texas. The FTC did not immediately respond to a request for comment. The Commission, Democrats, and worker advocates who support the rule say it is necessary to rein in the increasingly common practice of requiring workers to sign non-compete agreements, even in lower-paying service industries such as fast food and retail. The agreements suppress workers' wages by making it difficult for them to switch jobs, they say. The FTC on Tuesday said that banning non-compete agreements would increase workers' earnings by up to $488 billion over the next decade and will lead to the creation of more than 8,500 new businesses each year. But business groups and many Republicans have said that non-compete agreements are a vital tool for companies to protect confidential information and investments in their workforce. Legal challenges to the Commission's rule will almost certainly delay its implementation, regardless of the ultimate outcome, said Matt Durham, a labor lawyer at the firm Dorsey & Whitney in Salt Lake City. Lawmakers hear from kids, grandkids. TikTok measure prompts feedback from family, reported by Riley Began for the USA Today. Congress on Tuesday took the extraordinary step of passing legislation to force TikTok's Beijing-based parent company to sell it or face an effective ban in the United States. The policy agitated many of the app's young users who showed up on Capitol Hill, alongside lobbyists, to push lawmakers to reject it. But for some of these lawmakers, the debate was even closer to home as they grappled with questions from their kids and grandchildren. Senator Todd Young, Republican from Indiana, said his four teenagers use it, which is, quote, something I'm not proud of or comfortable with, per se. They actually get a fair amount of consumer value out of it in terms of interaction with their friends, social interaction, knowing what's happening, which can't be undervalued if you're a teacher, a teenager, he said. But I try and explain to them that's separate and apart from the national security considerations that we're having to weigh. They understand that, close quote. When the subject first came up in Congress, Senator Mike Rounds, Republican from South Dakota, recalled his 12-year-old granddaughter texting him, Grandpa, can you vote for TikTok not to get banned? He assured her they would take more time to look at the House's proposal. Weeks later, the vast majority of lawmakers in both parties and both chambers of Congress supported the measure, arguing TikTok's parent company poses a national security risk. Informed by Biden administration intelligence briefings, they have raised concerns about the possibility of the Chinese government spying on Americans and spreading propaganda through the app. TikTok says the Chinese government hasn't requested American users' data, data and that it wouldn't hand it over if they did. They also argued that the legislation violates America's, Americans' right to free speech and that banning the app would harm small businesses who rely on the app for exposure. So far, there has been no public evidence that the app is being used to spy on U.S. citizens, 
But reporting from multiple outlets has indicated TikTok's American operation has struggled to fully separate from its Chinese parent company. President Joe Biden signed the legislation Wednesday as part of a $95 billion foreign aid package to support Ukraine, Israel, and allies in the Indo-Pacific. Biden and the bill's proponent in Congress argue that it is not a ban, but would force TikTok's Beijing-based parent company, BitDance, to sell to a company that has more reliable data privacy rules. That hasn't been very reassuring for many of the young people that make up TikTok's 170 million American users, including influencers who have publicly slammed lawmakers for supporting the bill. But members who spoke with USA Today said their family members understand when they explain the risks. Quote, they don't want TikTok to go away, said Senator Mitt Romney, Republican from Utah, who has around two dozen grandchildren. But, when I t- but what I tell them is it's not going to go away. It's just going to get owned by an American company. They're pleased as punch. Close quote. Now that the legislation has been approved, expect TikTok to fight it in court. That has worked in the past. Former President Donald Trump also attempted to ban TikTok, which was blocked by a federal judge. More recently, a federal judge in Montana blocked a state ban, saying it, quote, likely violates the First Amendment, close quote. If BitDance is forced to comply, selling it will be complicated. TikTok is worth tens of billions of dollars, so only ultra-wealthy investors are likely able to afford it. That could include big technology companies like Meta, Google, or Amazon. Former Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin also said he's organizing investors to bid on the app. But the Chinese government would also likely block the sale of TikTok's TikTok's algorithm, which would force a buyer to rebuild a a crucial component of the app. A Pew Research poll released last December showed 38% of Americans supported banning TikTok, compared to 27% who oppose it and 35% who are unsure about the idea. Senator John Fetterman, Democrat of Pennsylvania, quipped last month that he's spent hundreds on drunk elephant skin care products for his teenage daughter because of viral videos on the app. So if he wanted to ban TikTok, he would have done it at home. She doesn't follow it as closely anymore because TikTok CEO Chu Xu Xi took the advice to just chill out and not blast messages to 170 million people, Fetterman said, referencing a flood of calls lawmakers received last month when TikTok prompted users to contact congressional offices. Quote, I said, this is going to pass and no one is trying to ban TikTok. Fetterman said Tuesday, you don't have to worry about these things. She's like, oh, that's cool, close quote. Senator Tom Tillis, Republican from North Carolina, said TikTok's early push to get users involved led one young woman to leave a voicemail saying, quote, I'll shoot you and find you and cut you into pieces, close quote. He said he's had discussions about the app with young people in his life including that young woman and her parents. Quote, there's a lot of misinformation going on here, he said. We're not shutting down TikTok. TikTok creates too much value to think that it would just disappear. What we're talking about is ownership governance. When I explain that to young people, they look at me like I have a horn growing out of my head, but their parents understand, and that's good enough to me, close quote. We're about at the middle of our broadcast, and so it's time for obituaries. We have one today. David G. Montani Sr., age 95, of Dennis, formerly of Milton and West Quincy, died peacefully Sunday, April 21, 2024, in the comfort of his home, surrounded by members of his loving family. David was born on April 19, 1929, in West Quincy, to the late Frank and Aurora Irene Carella Montani. 
Raised and educated in Quincy, he was a graduate of Quincy High School, class of 1948, where he was an outstanding quarterback and member of the QHS Football Hall of Fame. He lived in Dennis for 30 years and previously in Milton for 33 years. He began his career as an apprentice at the Full, Full River Shipyard, working for the Bethlehem Steel Company, where he first demonstrated a great ability to work with his hands and a mind that could envision what needed to be done. He left the shipyard to serve in the U.S. Navy Seabees, Mobile Construction Battalion 1, as a steel worker 3C during the Korean conflict. After his military service, Dave returned to the shipyard to complete his apprenticeship, graduating valedictorian in 1953. In 1952, he married Christine May Antonelli, daughter of Larry and Joseph Antonelli. Together, Dave and Christine raised 10 children, seven boys, and three girls. Their years together were filled with the joy of watching their family grow, a marriage of full measure and grace. Early in his career, Dave joined his father-in-law's steel business, L. Antonelli Ironworks, leading the fabrication side of the company. From a small operation, the company would grow to become one of the largest steel fabricators and steel erectors in New England. Memorable projects would include the altar for the 1979 John, Pope John Paul II visit to Boston, Fenway Park expansions, and the Basketball Hall of Fame. Predeceased by Christine in 1988, Dave found love again and married Mary E. St. John MacDonald in 1994 adding six stepchildren and numerous step-grandchildren to his family. Dave and Mary settled in Dennis, wintering in Florida and South Carolina, until her death in 2012. They enjoyed visiting their extended family throughout the countryside, attending countless events and accomplishments of grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Dave loved the ocean, the beach, and hosting gatherings at the family's Cape Cod residence. Never idle, he took on many projects around his home, puttering in his workshop to build personal treasures that ranged from jewelry boxes to bookshelves, end tables to coat racks, cribbage boards, and beyond. Anything he could dream up from a, scrap, a piece of scrap wood was fair game, as his creations found many a home with family and friends. Active in community fairs throughout his life, Dave was a member of the Quincy Rotary Club, the American Legion, the Knights of Columbus, and a proud member of the Quincy Lodge of Elks for 67 years. He also served on the Board of Directors for Catholic Charities of Boston and Fontbonne Academy in Milton. A devout Catholic, he was a longtime parishioner of St. Agatha's Church in Milton and St. Pius X Parish in Yarmouth. Dave lived a life of faith, family, and work, and with extended bonds of love overflowing in all three priorities. A Mass of Christian Burial will be celebrated at St. Agatha Church, 432 Adams Street, Milton, on Monday, April the 29th at 10.30 a.m. Relatives and friends are invited to attend. Visiting hours will be held at the Dolem Fun Funeral Home, 460 Granite Avenue, East Milton, on Sunday, April the 28th, from 2 to 5 p.m. Internment with military honors at Milton Cemetery. In lieu of flowers, donations in David's memory may be made to the Boston Home, Inc., 2049 Dorchester Avenue, Boston, Massachusetts, 02124. To leave the Montanis a condolence men message, please visit www.dolanfuneral.com. Here is a photograph with the title Fox Entertainment, and it's a picture of a fox kit. The caption is, A fox kit takes in some midday sun. This kit and its siblings have found a home in this weathered building within the dunes of the Cape Cod National Seashore in Provincetown. Completely outgunned. Keating cites low munitions in Ukraine visit, reported by Walker Armstrong for the Cape Cod Times. As a multi-billion dollar aid package for Ukraine loomed on the near horizon, 
a bipartisan group of four lawmakers from the U.S. House of Representatives, visited the Eastern European nation Monday as a diplomatic effort to reinforce U.S. support ahead of an expected Russian military offensive. U.S. Representative William Keating, Democrat of Massachusetts, told the Times on Tuesday. The group, which included two Republicans and two Democrats, met with several high-ranking Ukrainian officials, including the Minister of Defense, pro-government reform groups, anti-corruption officials, and the Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. Following a phone call the Ukrainian President took with U.S. President Joe Biden, Keating said the group met with Zelensky for nearly an hour. Keating said Ukraine is in the midst of a crisis point in their war with Russia as money, munitions, and other vital military supplies run low. Quote, they've just been completely outgunned, Keating said. It isn't a lack of determination or courage. They're just lacking the ammunition. Keating represents the 9th Congressional District, which includes the Cape and Islands, South Coast, and South Shore. Hours before the visit with Zelensky, the House voted to push a roughly $60 billion aid package for Ukraine through to the U.S. Senate. As of Tuesday afternoon, the bill had the majority necessary to clear the chamber in a final vote. The Senate, later on Tuesday, approved a package that would funnel $60 billion to support Ukraine, $19 billion for Israel, $9 billion in humanitarian aid for Gaza and elsewhere, and $8 billion for allies in the Indo-Pacific, with a bipartisan 79-18 to vote. Biden signed the legislation into law Wednesday. Zelensky was relieved that the House package went through, Keating said. It was just days before that he was in very hot water with the Russians, where the Russians were pushing them back and the munitions ratio was 10 to, 10 to 1 in favor of the Russians. Additional aid for Ukraine has been a polarizing issue for Republicans and Democrats alike. Supporters of aid stress the importance of defending global allies of the U.S. in the face of rising authoritarianism and the threat of additional military conflict. Opponents in the U.S. point to a need to address domestic issues, such as securing the country's southern border and dealing with inflation. Keating said the aid package is a strategic victory in the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, sending an important message to Russian President Vladimir Putin and strengthening Ukrainian resolve. Quote, every single military person I've spoken to that's on our side says it's pay less now or pay more later, Keating said, referring to Putin's intention of bringing other Soviet satellite states back into the Russian fold. Quote, we are required to support our allies. Tennessee GOP passes armed teachers bill. Opponents disrupt the House after its approval, reported by Melissa Brown and Angeli Latham for the Nashville Tennessean. Tennessee House Republicans on Tuesday passed legislation to allow some trained teachers and school staff to carry handguns, despite, despite pleas from Democrats, students, and gun reform advocates to defeat the bill. Dozens of protesters in the galleries began chanting, Blood on your hands! as soon as the legislation passed, prompting Republican House Speaker Cameron Sexton to order state troopers to clear the galleries. Many protesters continued to chant and stomp down at lawmakers as the House floor fell into chaos over parliamentary issues. The bill is all but guaranteed to become law within weeks, as Governor Bill Lee can either sign it into law or allow it to become law without his signature. Lee has never vetoed a bill. Armed teachers, who will be required to undergo training that some opponents have argued is not intensive enough, will be allowed to carry handguns in their classrooms and in most campus situations without informing parents and most of their colleagues that they're armed. The school district's director of schools, the school principal, and the chief of the appropriate law enforcement agency 
must sign off on a staff member's authority to carry a concealed handgun. So school administrators could theoretically block any teacher from going armed on campus. On Tuesday, Republicans rejected several Democratic attempts to amend the bill, including retiring teachers keep their handguns locked up except during a school security breach, holding teachers civilly liable for using their guns on campus and informing parents when guns are on campus. Democrats on Tuesday were broadly critical of the bill, both skeptical it could effectively stop a school shooter and concerned about unintended consequence, such as a teacher leaving a gun unintended. Quote, this is nothing but a bad disaster and tragedy waiting to happen if we do not ensure personal responsibility, said House Democratic Caucus Chair John Ray Clemens. Our children's lives are at stake, close quote. <clears throat> Republicans in favor of the measure have argued trained staff can increase school security, particularly in rural areas where law enforcement may be more sparsely staffed with greater response times. The General Assembly last year funded school resource officer positions at all Tennessee schools with the ability for SROs to go armed. Staffing issues have complicated hiring, and nearly 600 schools don't have an SRO in place. Sponsor Representative Ryan Williams said his bill was aimed to protect students and act as a deterrent for potential school security threats. Williams also pointed to a previous 2016 law that allowed some school districts in distressed counties, an economic indicator established by the state, to opt into a teacher handgun carry program, noting this isn't totally unprecedented in Tennessee. Quote, as a parent of public school kids, my kids are grown now, people ask me all the time, have you done everything you could possibly do to make our schools safe across the state? I believe that this is the method by which we can do that, Williams said. Williams continually pointed out that the bill is permissive, meaning no school will be required to allow guns on campus, though the bill appears to require administrators to consider every individual who wants to carry rather than issue a blanket school or district policy opting out from the program. Quote, if they did say that, they would be telling their entire community that the deterrent doesn't exist there, Williams said later saying gun-free schools are zones where, quote, people know they can go there and take advantage of folks, close quote. The bill sparked vocal protests in the Senate earlier this month as parents of school shooting survivors, gun reform advocates, and students have heavily lobbied against this bill. A Covenant school mom delivered a letter to the House on Monday with more than 5,300 signatures asking lawmakers to kill the bill. Sarah Shoup Newman's letter criticized gaps in training and burdening teachers with the responsibilities of confronting an assailant with a gun while keeping an entire classroom safe. Earlier this month, Covenant parent Melissa Alexander begged senators to listen to parents whose children have survived a school shooting. Alexander and fellow Covenant mom Mary Joyce have repeatedly told lawmakers their children were saved by teachers who kept their classes quiet and out of sight, and the pair questioned what would have happened if a teacher confronted a school shooter armed with greater firepower. They also echoed widespread concern among the bill's opponents about its secrecy clause, which bars school administrators from revealing who in the school is armed, except, except to relevant law enforcement and school staff who are responsible for campus security. Williams said the bill seeks to shield gun carriers' identities to prevent them from, from related hiring and firing decisions. Quote, I've heard so many times about parental consent that it's a parent's responsibility to raise their child, said Representative Justin Pearson, who called the bill absolutely insane on Tuesday. 
I also think it's a parent's job to know if their child is being put at risk by having someone in the classroom with a firearm that another child could find that could be discharged and actually harm them or other kids, close quote. Representative Bo Mitchell apologized to Covenant parents from the House floor while presenting an amendment. Sexton cut M- Mitchell's mic off at one point, telling him he was off topic. Mitchell continued to yell into the House chamber, quote, We've done nothing for you whatsoever, Mitchell said. This is embarrassing as a legislature that will bring more guns into schools and not do anything to save your children's lives. I am sorry. Opponents of the bill filled the public house gallery on Tuesday, holding signs reading things like, shame, and one kid is greater than all the guns. Clearly in the debate, Sexton gaveled down vocal, early in the debate, Sexton gaveled down vocal protesters and warned he would clear the gallery if necessary. He later directed troopers to remove one woman, Lauren Shipman Dorrance, from the ticketed gallery. Shipman Dorrance, a Davidson County teacher and parent, has worked to advocate for gun reform for the last year. For some sports news, don't get tackled by ticket scams for the NFL draft, reported by Susan Tampor for the Detroit Free Press. All you need to know about scammers during the NFL draft this week in Detroit is they've got a nose for the ball. Thousands of football fans will are likely to suddenly realize that they don't want to miss out on a chance of a lifetime to go to the 2024 draft in Detroit on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and many are going to start hunting online for tickets at the last minute. Quote, unsuspecting fans could pay money for a ticket that was otherwise free or spend hundreds or even thousands on what turns out to be a phony screenshot of a ticket that doesn't exist or has previously been sold, according to an alert issued by Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel. Attorney General Dana Nessel. It's free to get into the NFL draft experience. Fans register for free entry by downloading the NFL One Pass app or going to nfl.com slash draft access. That's one word. Adults can register up to five children to get into the event. And yes, fans can still register. The NFL Draft 2024 website notes that fans without a smartphone will be able to register on site via the NFL fan services staff. Fans use the same QR code during all three days. But it's important to understand that the event is first come, first serve, and subject to capacity limits, according to the NFL. The NFL One Pass, for example, will get people access to the corner ballpark as part of the festivities on Detroit's Corktown neighborhood, in Detroit's Corktown neighborhood, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, where there will be screens to watch the NFL draft on NFL Network. The corner ballpark serves as a hub for youth activities during the draft, and the old historic Tiger Stadium site will offer an extension of activities a few miles away at Hart Plaza and Campus Martius Park. The NFL One Pass QR code will not get fans seated in the draft theater where football prospects, prospects will be selected by their new teams. Official premium draft ticket packages for the 2024 NFL Draft are sold out, according to the on-location site linked via nfl.com slash draft on Monday morning. And tickets for the Detroit Lions loyal member exclusive draft party on Thursday, which were priced at $25 a ticket, are sold out too. The event wasn't open to the general public. It is not affiliated with the, quote, NFL draft presented by Bud Light and does not offer access to the NFL draft event at Hart Plaza and Campus Martius Park. Quote, a big draw might have been that parking was available for $40 per spot with purchase of these member-only tickets. 
Given that we're late in the game here when it comes to tickets and that premium NFL draft tickets are sold out via the official site, it's a safe bet that scammers will craft ways to rip off customers, as they did with Taylor Swift tickets in the summer and Detroit Lions playoff tickets in January. Nestle warns that bad actors often use a variety of tactics, including asking potential victims to send money through a payment or money app. Run, don't walk away from ticket sellers who want money via Apple Pay, Cash App, Circle Pay, Facebook Payments, Google Pay, PayPal, Square Cash, Zelle, and Venmo. The same is true if a seller asks for payment with gift cards or through a Bitcoin ATM. Fans risk losing your money instantly once it's transformed electronically, and they won't get any tickets. Unfortunately, social media platforms make it even easier for con artists to connect with eager fans. Quote, you can never be too safe when it comes to where and who you're buying tickets from, according to a warning about scams posted on Ticketmaster blog. These days, the blog noted, fans can, quote, experience the letdown of arriving at an event only to find out their tickets are counterfeit, whether they purchased them from someone claiming to have legitimate tickets for sale on social media or third-party sites or unofficial marketplaces like Craigslist. It's essential to be skeptical about buying tickets from individual sellers, social media, third-party online exchanges, auction sites, or bulletin boards. When ticket demand is hot, as it could be with a much-hyped event like the NFL draft, the potential losses to scammers could be significant, especially considering previous ticket scams. Trump campaigning from courtroom. Candidate is stuck in New York but is still making hay, reported by David Jackson for USA Today. Donald Trump's New York hush money trial hasn't stopped the former president from pursuing an unprecedented presidential campaign. During various chats with reporters, Trump has complained that he should be out campaigning, but instead has to sit in a freezing cold courtroom. However, while going through the first ever criminal trial of a current or former president, Trump is almost as busy promoting his campaign as he is condemning the judge, the prosecutor, and the trial itself, as well as President Joe Biden and other critics. Speaking with supporters before Tuesday's session, Trump asked supporters in Pennsylvania to vote in the state's primary to send a message ahead of the general election in the fall. Quote, let them know that we're coming on November 5th, he said. We're coming big. Last week, during a campaign-like stop at a Harlem bodega, Trump bragged, we're going to end up doing so well. Trump is aiming his appeals largely at a key group, independents and moderate Republicans who say they may turn away from him if he is convicted. Longtime Trump watchers told USA Today the former president is still using the same kind of tactics he did after he was charged in four separate indictments last year, starting with the hush money charges. Then and now, Trump has conducted quasi-campaign events to complain about the legal moves against him and promote his presidential candidacy in spite of them. According to a recent Reuters Ipsos poll, some 13 percent of the people who said they would vote for Trump would not do so if he's a convicted felon. The poll also said that 24 percent of Republicans surveyed wouldn't vote for Trump if he is convicted, more than enough to make the difference in a general election. Quote, even if he just loses 10 percent of his base, that's huge, said Chris Jackson, a senior vice president with Ipsos Public Affairs. But Jackson added that Trump and Biden campaigns are punching in the dark about the trial's impact on voters. Quote, this is all new territory for the country, he said, so no one knows how it will pan out. So far, the Trump-Biden race is at a dead heat. The real clear politics average gives Trump a lead of 0.2 percentage points, well within the margins of error. It could take six or seven weeks before the verdict comes in for tr Trump's hush money f trial. Marathon proceedings that could move the needle for some voters as November's general election grows closer. 
It's unclear if Trump will go on trial in 2024 in any of the other three criminal cases where he has also pleaded not guilty. While it's not clear if Trump's approach will resonate with voters, he did spend the worst the first week of jury se- selection offering previews of his quote campaign within a trial. After the April 6th, 16th court se- session, Trump's motorcade ferried him to the bodega in Harlem, where he spoke to reporters about Biden, tri- crime, and House Speaker Mike Johnson's spending plans, and made frequent complaints about the trial. The former president has staged several other campaign within a trial events. Last week, for example, he met with Poland President Andrzej Duda. Quote, we're all behind Poland all the way, Trump told reporters. Trump held another foreign policy huddle Tuesday night at his Manhattan skyscraper with Tara Aso, the vice president of the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan and the country's former prime minister. Not everything has gone according to plan. Trump has urged people to come out in person on his behalf. During Tuesday's brief statement before trial testimony resumed, Trump lamented the relative lack of support at the courthouse. He appeared to blame it on a massive police presence, even as anti-Israel protesters flocked to the nearby campuses of Columbia and New York universities. Video outside the courthouse showed a low-key police presence at best. That's all we have time for today. This has been Daphne. I'm reading the Cape Cod Times for Thursday, April the 25th. I hope that you have a great weekend and enjoy the longer days.